Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, Russia Gate and why it won't just go away. We're, our guest is Ray McGovern. He was an infantry intelligence officer in the early 60s, became a CIA analyst. His duties eventually included chairing national intelligence estimates and preparing the president's daily brief. He conducted the one-on-one -on -one morning briefings of President Reagan's five most senior national security officials, including Vice President Bush, from 1981 to 1985. In retirement, Ray co-founded Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, VIPS, an attempt by intelligence veterans to hold former colleagues to account for, quote, fixing intelligence to justify wars like Iraq. His website is raymcgovern.com. Ray, welcome back to Talk World Radio. Thanks, David. Thanks for coming on again. Thanks for everything you've been doing. Uh, your recent article that I really want to talk about was in antiwar.com, and it was titled The Guardian Regurgitating the Russiagate Canard. Can you explain? Sure. Uh, if there is one discredited journalist in Britain, and there are many, uh, one holds the distinction for being the, the most egregiously uh, disingenuous and discredited. His name is Luke Harding. Uh, my best, my favorite Russian expert, when I asked him about this latest one, said, look, I, when I saw the, the name Luke Harding, I wouldn't read the thing. It's, it's, all, it's all trash, or as the British say, it was rubbish. So what he is doing is trying to <laughs> pretend uh, that someone in the Kremlin had given a sheaf of documents which show exactly what happened. Oh my God, you know, incredibly prescient, including the business about stirring, stirring animosity within the United States, uh, doing all kinds of terrible things, which is what the Russians, of course, did in trying to help Trump win the election. Now, David, it's a real problem uh, because people don't understand that there is such a thing as objective truth. <laughs> Uh, and they can't get it from the mainstream media. Uh, hello? Okay. And they have to either reason to it or tune in to David Swanson's program or something like that to get it. And even very progressive people. I did a, yeah, I, I did a lecture out at for Veterans for Peace out in Seattle three years ago. And I titled it, um, Can You... Can you handle the truth on Russiagate? It was that, you know, take off on that old film. And I, I went round down the line, uh, this three years ago, and at the end, I thought I was being really persuasive. And guess what? All these progressive folks couldn't handle the truth. They couldn't handle it. And I'll go back to that maybe a little bit because I've learned a little bit more since. But I think people need to realize that this started out back in June, July of 2016. Now, the catalyst was uh, Julian Assange announced that he had emails related to Hillary Clinton, his words, and they were pending publication. That was on the 12th of June. Now, the 14th of June, you had this CrowdStrike outfit that has a dubious reputation saying, oh, we have evidence uh, that, that these emails came from a Russian hack. And then lo and behold, the next day on the 15th of June, Lucifer 2.0 arises from the ashes. Okay. Now, I don't know who Lucifer 2.0 is. I'm not sure Joe Biden knows. I am sure that John Brennan James Comey, those guys know, okay. But anyhow, he had adulterated uh, sort of formats from Microsoft type things, which had Cyrillic on them. And they showed, they pretended, that the Russians were behind this. As a matter of fact, just so nobody would draw any other conclusion, the name of the first Russian head of the KGB, it was called the Cheka in those days, Felix Emunovich, Zerzinski 
his first name and patronymic <laughs> were on this on this format. So either the Russians were incredibly clumsy, which the Russian intelligence service are not noted to be, or somebody wanted to make damn sure these dumb Americans realize this this is evidence, it's a relic, yeah, this is the Russians doing it. So that's how it all started. Now, what would Hillary Clinton do? My God. Emails pertaining to Hillary Clinton. Oh, my God. If they have the DNC emails, my God, if they have the DNC emails, they will show how I, well, how the how the things were stacked against Bernie. Well, how I stole the nomination from him. I mean, let's, let's be clear with the primaries. I mean, I, I mean, if there's chapter and verse in it, my God, what are we going to do? So, again, mid-June, the convention, Democratic convention, was to start July 25th. We only have, what's that? I do the math. Okay, what, seven weeks or so. What, if I, what will we do? <laughs> Somebody around the table, I know, Hillary, I know. What's, what's that? Blame it on Russia. Blame it on the Russians. For God's sake, it, it, it's not the Russians, it's WikiLeaks. No problem. We hate WikiLeaks almost as much as we hate the Russians. We'll say the Russians hacked in, gave the take to WikiLeaks, so they publish it to discredit you and help tr Trump in his campaign. So Hillary looks around and says, uh, <laughs> anybody got any better ideas? Oh, okay, we'll go with it. Now, how do I know that they went with it? <laughs> well, as soon as the emails were were published by WikiLeaks, who received it, by the way, from an exterior uh, storage device, a thumbnail, uh, a, a thumb thing or uh, something. You know. Anyhow, uh, as soon as they were published on the 22nd of July, so three days before the Democratic Convention, all hell broke loose. The New York Times and the New York Post and the Washington Post, they're all primed. The headlines rang, why did Russia do this? Why did Russia do this? Why did Russia do this? And uh, John McCain said, this is an act of war by Russia, act of war. What were they obscuring? <laughs> Reg, if I could just stop you for a second, as I want this story to continue, uh, we're speaking with Ray McGovern. But as you'll recall, and very, very, very few people will recall, the response of some of us at this point in time was, who the heck cares who did it? We owe them a debt of gratitude. We <laughs> ought to know what nefarious, secretive uh, scheming and, and plotting and unfair biasing of elections our political parties that run this country are up to. Whoever's making this public, showing us how the Democratic Party operates, we ought to be thanking them. Uh, and if it came from Russia, well, that'll be interesting. Let's see some evidence. That's another question. But how does that question erase the content of the emails? Well, that was the most bizarre thing. Once you scream Russia, <laughs> you're not allowed to look at the emails anymore. I mean, that was not just a false claim. That was a weird twist of thought, wasn't it? Yeah, do you remember the, the film uh, Magnificent Obsession? Well, this was a magnificent diversion, okay? The whole point of it was to blame it on the Russians so that nobody would read the emails. Now, as I said before, the emails showed definitively that Hillary had stolen the nomination from Bernie Sanders, and that's what she was so so worried about. My God, that's that's why they had to divert the attention. And, uh, you know, it... it, it uh, it really resonated with everyone because she had to figure out something to do, and she did. Now, the Russians were easy prey. Uh, we had, uh, well, the head of national intelligence who knows all about Russia. His name was James Clapper. And just in case people don't know how much an expert on Russians James Clapper was, I'm going to read you what he told uh, Chuck Todd uh, right after he retired. He said, you know, um, we know the Russians were doing, with, in the context of everything else, we know the Russians were going to interfere into the election. You know why? Just the historical practices of the Russians, who typically are almost genetically driven 
to co-opt, penetrate, gain favor, whatever, which is a typical Russian technique. So we were concerned. Now, Clapper isn't the sharpest knife in the drawer. He might really believe this, okay? <laughs> I mean, racist as it is, he might believe this. But the other guys, you know, Comey and uh, Brennan of the CIA, and the, but they, were, they were actually really hell-bent on helping Hillary win. And so the whole thing was divert attention from the emails. Now, just take a step back and ask a question. Uh, did it? Did it hurt Hillary? You know, whoever was responsible, as you point out, well, they were authentic. Nobody claimed they weren't authentic. The five chief people of the DNC quit on the spot. What does that tell you? Okay. Now, I know a lot of people that campaigned really hard for more than a year for Bernie. Okay. They're Democrats. I don't know about a lot about such things in domestic politics, but I know a lot of friends who wouldn't go near a voting booth to vote for Hillary after they found out, after they read the emails. There were some people that read the emails, okay? So my conclusion, yeah, it probably hurt her, but your question is, were they authentic? Yeah, they were authentic. Should the Americans have known about this? Well, I think so. I mean, why didn't Bernie... <laughs> well, I, I won't get into that, but Bernie was such a terrible disappointment. And anyway, well, he could have stood up at the convention and said, look, this is really bad. This is really bad. And read, read some of the emails. Anyhow, what happened was this. Uh, during the convention itself, uh, Hillary decided we're going to push this Russian thing real, real hard. OK, now we know that because everyone was briefed on it. Uh, this guy, David Sanger, in the New York Times, came out with a big thing about the Russians' interference that same day that she announced it. I think it was the 26th of July, 2016. And guess what? The Russians, the Russian intelligence prepared a, a, a brief for their superiors. Hillary Clinton is going to blame everything on uh, the Russians. Okay. Now, how do I know that? Uh, because the director of national intelligence released the Russian report. And why did he release the Russian report? Well, because the American people were entitled to do this. And besides that, it came from a leak. Now, it came from a leak. What does that mean? That means some, somebody within the intelligence community was so distraught about what was going on that they decided to leak the Russian version of what Hillary had done and uh, have it get get played in the press. Now, how do I know that? Well, I know that because I know that when somebody leaks something, there's a crimes report, okay? It's, it's, it's the law, it's the regulation. You have to send a crimes report to the uh, Department of Justice and the FBI is supposed to follow up on it. That was done. Obama was briefed on it. That's also required in something serious like this. So you have David Sanger and the Russians all at the same time, end of July, during the Democratic Convention, uh, saying, okay, this is this is what's going on. Uh, be prepared. Uh, we're going to blame it on the Russians. Now, I had the privilege, because I, I lived in Washington for so long, of visiting oh, meetings or soirees or uh, whatever, uh, including ones run by Podesta and Hillary's old think, think tank, if you can call it that. So I want to just quote something that nobody knows about because they weren't there. I was there, okay? I asked a question toward the end, but didn't get much resonance. But Jennifer Palmieri, who is Hillary Clinton's PR person, was there. And she had just written a, a, a really interesting Washington Post feature saying, man, I just feel so proud of how we told the American people about Russian hacking and Russian interference in the election. So it was all that kind of tenor. And here's, a, I, I wrote, wrote it up because it was really, really important. Uh, this is what she said. Uh, uh, the idea behind Trump campaign coordinating with Russia to defeat Hillary Clinton, that was too fantastic for people to, mm, uh, for the press to mm, process to absorb but i went around on my little golf cart to all the outlets at the convention tried to sell this story and no one would believe it but when we got back to brooklyn 
Brooklyn, where the campaign headquarters were. But back to Brooklyn, uh, and then we heard from the intelligence people and the people in the press who worked with the intelligence people. And what we learned about the dossier and other storylines that were swirling around and how to process, how to, and along the way, the administration started confirming these stories. So now you're into August, you're into September, and the administration is starting to confirm these stories. Well, long story short, it gets down to just before the election, and the stories are going, and then everybody's trying to uh, blame Trump for cavorting with the Russians and the Russians for interfering. But, you know, the Americans didn't give a, didn't give a, didn't give a rat's patootie. Okay? What they cared about was something else. And they voted for Trump anyway. Now, what did that mean? That meant that these guys, you know, Trump called Comey and Brennan and Clapper, uh, what do you call them? Hi, uh, dirty cops, dirty cops. Well, David, I know a lot of dirty cops in the Bronx where I grew up. They would be very offended to be to be compared with with Comey and Clapper and, and Brennan. These guys were they were out to make sure Hillary won. They were afraid of Trump. They couldn't figure out what Trump would do. They might lose their jobs for God's sake. So the big thing was something that was admitted actually by Comey in his book. He wrote a book about the, a year later. And he said, you know, this is a quote, I was operating under the assumption that Hillary Rodham Clinton would be the next president of the United States. End quote. Okay. Right. Now they all were. Everyone was. And so if that's your assumption, you help her win, discredit Trump, and you get promoted, you stay in place, you, you, you get an award, you won't get indicted. You know? <laughs> then what happens? Oh, my God, Trump wins. What do you do then? Then you cover your tracks. Then you do everything you can to make sure that Trump can act as president. You try to undermine him at every point. And I should say right now, uh, because I'm getting into dangerous territory, I can see people getting their backs up and hair going out of the back of the neck, okay? I think Donald Trump was the worst president the United States ever had. And that's saying something I know a little bit about US, US history. Uh, and what you're hearing is an analysis by someone who's used to analyzing things in a nonpartisan, tell it like it is fashion. I hate it that the Democrats act that way. I mean, my father was a my father cried right. when I died, okay? So I'm a long, long-term long person that used to be very inclined to the Democrats. So, so just to clear the air there, uh, what I'm saying here is that we have further proof now that the whole thing uh, was was uh, invented, uh, that G Palmieri admitted that that's what she was tasked to do and what she did so, so bravely and so successfully. And she finished this thing. I, I just really, she finished this a little. Uh, Ray, before we go too terribly long, if I could just squeeze in really quickly, I think a key question for most people mm -hmm. is not the motivations and who said what first, but the proof or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. uh, because most people hear your account and they think, well, yes, and it was all proven and documented and pinned down and indisputable. Uh, whereas the fact was that there was never actually any evidence be up behind the claims, correct? That's right. Yeah. Uh, in a thumbnail, you have the reports that the DNC computers and servers were hacked, okay? Now, James Comey, head of the FBI at the time, uh, didn't want to get in there and investigate those computers. Why? Well, I'll leave that to you to surmise. Pick this CrowdStrike outfit to do the job, a very dubious outfit which had been wrong on many accounts, but always very, very anti-Russian, okay? And for the whole schmear then, not only Comey, but his, his best friend Bob Mueller depended on this CrowdStrike. Now, get this, the 5th of December, 2017, 17. The head of CrowdStrike, 
Sean Henry, under oath, is asked, what about the Russian hacking? He says, well, actually, uh, we've looked at all those computers and servers. There was no hacking. Exfiltration is the fancy word for it. No, no exfiltration. N not by the Russians? No, not by the Russians. Not by anybody. We have no evidence that those emails were exfiltrated through a hack. Whoa. Okay. December 5th. Was there much media reporting of this? 17. Somehow or other, um, the media missed that because Adam Schiff, who was head of the Senate Intelligence Committee by then, uh, held it close to his chest. Finally, Trump uh, appoints a new director of national intelligence. And in May of 2020, so December, <laughs> two years later, later. Yeah, do the math, all right? May of 2020, um, Adam Schiff releases Sean Henry, head of CrowdStrike's testimony. Now, my God, you know, I look at that, write about it right away, and wait for the New York Times take on this. Uh, hello? <laughs> Still waiting. It's completely suppressed from the media. Now, get this. 2020, May 7th. So that's 14 months more, okay? Now, why was it suppressed? Well, the election was coming up. The election was coming up. And uh, you didn't want Russiagate uh, to fall apart. You wanted to still be able to use it against Trump. And so Adam Schiff how to release this stuff, but luckily, the New York Times did the rest of the deal. So two and a half months, Adam Schiff, but now we have a year and two months by the New York Times. You're, most of you listeners probably don't know that there is actually no evidence at all, according to the head of CrowdStrike, the cyber firm that looked into it, that the Russians or anyone else hacked those emails, which leaves the question, of course, how did they get to WikiLeaks? And President, President Obama, two days before he left office, said at a press conference, you know, uh, uh, the conclusions of the intelligence community with respect to how WikiLeaks got those emails are inconclusive. Huh? Okay, he's a lawyer, right? He's talking about inconclusive conclusions, right? Why do you do that? I guess he's a lawyer. He's got his own patootie, okay? But <laughs> if you got inconclusive conclusions, that didn't, pre that didn't prevent my former colleagues of the CIA from drawing up this, this assessment, originally acclaimed by Hillary Clinton as being all 17 intelligence agencies of our government. And then five months later, James Clapper said, well, actually, with only three, and actually, it was only handpicked analysts from those three. And now we know from the testimony of Kash Patel that it amounted to four or five analysts working for CIA director John Brennan. That's how that's how bogus that was, and that's how it never deserved the, the title intelligence community assessment. Assessment was right. That means, well, in the old army we used to say the swag factor, the scientific wild ass guess. That's what a, what assessment is. Uh, but, uh, degrees of confidence. Uh, Ray, with about four minutes left, has the Guardian not reproven all of this stuff redundantly? Uh, brought out solid new evidence with bits of stuff written in Russian to prove it once again. Well, look, Harden and the and the Guardian have no shame. Uh, you know, the first thing I I thought of was, uh, you know, have you finally no shame? The question during McCarthy. Um, they're way out on a limb. Uh, they have made all kinds of strange assertions, like uh, Manafort visited uh, my friend Julian Assange in the embassy. Uh, it, all these things are completely proven wrong, and yet they never retract it. It doesn't matter. The people read the story, and they believe it. And the, if there is a retraction on page 19, uh, people don't read that or pay little attention to it. So. It's the media. You know, I, I talk now about not the MIC, the military industrial complex, and 
I'm remembering the military industrial complex forum that you ran, uh, David, about 11 years at, ago. At 50, we're now over 60, right? <laughs> oh, it's over 60, yeah. But it's no longer the Mick. It's the Mickey Mat. You got a pencil? Okay, you want to take this down. <laughs> it's the Military Industrial Congressional Intelligence Media Academia Think Tank Complex. Now, why do I say media, all caps? Because that's the linchpin. That, that, that's what makes it all possible. And the media is run by the conglomerates that run the rest of the Mickey Mat. That's what we're in now. And without programs like yours, David, and others like it, the American people have no prayer, have no, no way of getting the real story. You know, there's a story I'd, I'd like to just tell, and it's about these two uh, devoted uh, Russiagate uh, people uh, who got up to heaven. They died and went up to heaven. So St. Peter, oh, St. Peter. Okay, finally, go ask God about the Russian interference in the election. And and, and St. Peter said, okay. He comes back five minutes later and says, you know, God says that the Russian had nothing to do with the 2016 election. And one of the guys turns to the other and he says, oh, bummer. God is in on this too. <laughs> God's working for Putin. God's <laughs> God in, in pay from the Kremlin. Well, yeah. Putin, really, really clever guy. Yeah. Yeah. We, Ray McGovern. Uh, let, let me tell you we, this woman I was talking to. I said, you know, you've been brainwashed. Uh, and she says, no, no, I haven't been brainwashed. If I had been brainwashed, I would read about it in the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that proves it. Uh, wait, with, with one minute left, Ray McGovern, uh, where would we be in terms of support for NATO and wars and buildup of weapons around Russia without uh, this Russia Gate madness? I mean, there is something of a dangerous side effect here, isn't there? There is indeed, and people seem totally oblivious to the dangers here. All except Putin and Lavrov and the other people who are trying to rein this 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 administration in. Uh, I'll just close by saying we are fortunate indeed to have some sang froid, some 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 realism and some reticence on the part of our supposed uh, opponents in Russia. And the big sea change, of course, is that it's not just Russia; it's Russia and China. We are the short end of the stick now. And there's no no sense that I can get from any of the pronouncements from the White House that they even realize that that is a real problem. No question. We, we've been speaking with Ray McGovern. You can find his work at raymcgovern.com. And his recent article at antiwar.com is called The Guardian, Regurgitating the Russia Gate Canard. Ray McGovern, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Always a pleasure, David. Thanks very much. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.